Today's video is going to be all about the Time for Learning website for homeschool. I'm going to show you everything that it has to offer, how to use it, and I'm going to give you my honest review and opinion on whether it's a good curriculum, whether it's worth the money. So let's get started. For those of you that don't know me, my name's Amanda, and I am a homeschooling mom of three. So when you first get to the Time for Learning website, you can log in as either the student or the parent. We have recently signed up for this again. This is something that we used in our homeschooling curriculum in the past, then we took a break, and then we just signed up again. So I've already signed up, and I'm gonna start off by showing you the parent section, and then we'll switch over to the student section so you can see how that works. So I'm gonna log in as the parent, and when you first log in, this is the screen that it shows you. So it's just gonna give you a little overview of the work that was completed. It won't show you till the next day, unfortunately, and my daughter didn't do any work yesterday, so there's nothing to show here or here. She did do some today, but I guess it wasn't in time for this video. But anywho, this is where you'll just get a little overview of what your child has done. Now, over here is where you can manage students. You can have more than one student enrolled at a time, so you can you know, manage that over here. Also manage the grade level. We'll get into that. You can have this from anywhere to from pre-K all the way up through high school, so there's a lot of room to choose the grade level there and you can choose different grade levels based on different subjects so if your kid's a little bit ahead in one subject you can up the grade level there which is really great for flexibility then uh, we have the lesson planning here this is where you can go into detail with the lesson plan and and pick for your child and then of course your account information here so i don't want to start off showing you is the lesson planning part of the website. This is where you can view what the lesson plans are for each grade and subject. And then you can even do this activity planner, which I have not tried yet. So we're gonna try that together and see what that's like. But let's just take a look quick at the lesson plans. So here you can see they've got languages, which is an additional thing that you have to sign up for, which I did not sign up for but then you've got this divided by preschool elementary middle school and high school my oldest that is using this right now is eight so we're in the elementary school level uh you know you can see what the pre-k has elementary middle school they add an electives part and then high school they have the electives so I'm just going to show you the elementary part today because that's where we are at. So if you're in elementary, we have language arts. They've got it divided up by kindergarten through grade five. There's additional resources here, reading lists. So there's all sorts of stuff. If we were to pick second grade, for instance. Now here's the lesson plan, the whole thing. For second grade there are 43 lessons 275 activities and you can even look further detail and see what each lesson is going to consist of and even all all detail of everything you want to see so you can do this for each and every lesson each and every grade each and every subject over here on the right you're going to see that there are offline resources that you can download if you so choose and they come with answer keys too. This one is 57 pages. So if you want to incorporate worksheets and writing, you can do that here. If you like worksheets, I just wanna take a moment to mention that there is a really great deal on a website called Creative Fabrica. There's something called a teacher club card for $2.99 
a year, you get access to over 10,000 digital downloads of, of worksheet type materials created by teachers. I have the link in my description below if that's something that interests you. Back to time for learning. So we've got a 57 page printout just for language for second grade. So you'll notice as you go along that each of the grades has their own version of something like this, each of the subjects. So there is a lot included. You're not just getting the little online learning, you're getting this additional stuff. You can also, if you are an organized person, you can print out this whole six week guide. But again, this is all customizable. They can go at their own pace and you get to decide what they learn, what they don't need to learn. You know, you can set up the plans as I have not done yet, but we're going to try. So again, this part of the website here is view lesson plans. You can view them for each subject. So for math, we also have an offline resource bundle, another one of those big long printouts. There's answer, answer, there's answer keys for the bundle. You can view all the chapters. There are a total of 103 lessons and 309 activities for second grade math. So it just goes like that for all of the subjects. Let's try out the activity planner. So we can create a student planner. Now, you can either do a curriculum calculator. This is a simple calculation that charts out the number of activities to do daily to complete all of the time for learning material your student received. Or you can do a detailed plan. I'm really interested in the detailed plan, but just for the heck of it, let's see what the curriculum calculator would do. So let's say she was going to start today. And let's say we wanted her to finish by the end of June. And she's going to do three days a week. So she would need to do 56 activities of language arts a month, 57 of math, 22 of science, 28 of social studies. So this is just basically a calculator of how you can spread it out. So you want to do the detailed plan. That's what I want to do. So let's take a look at that. Detailed plan. All right. Pick your active student. Plan name. I'll call it plan one. It's going to be starting today. And we'll end it end of June. I don't know. We're more of an unschooling family, so I don't have this stuff all planned out. Okay, and we're going to want her to do all four language arts, math, science, and social studies. I've got her enrolled in third grade for all of these. Again, I'll show you after how you can change the grade level, but just for the purposes of what we're doing right here. We want her to do all the material or choose the material. Well, I kind of want to choose the material, so that's what I'm picking. All right, it wants me to choose math first because that's what I clicked first. So, okay, there's 284 activities. So here is where you could go through and say to yourself, well, what, you know, what do you want to take out? Do we need all of this? Are some of these things she already knows? We hit, oh, and you can take out quizzes. You can take out tests. That's really important if you're a family that doesn't believe in grading and testing and things like that. That's really awesome that you can remove those if you wanted. You can also remove the worksheets if you wanted. So let's just say I want all of it. I'm going to save that. And then this here is if you do include the tests and quizzes, you can pick a score at which you would want them to have to redo it in order to pass. So when they do the quizzes, which I will show you in a minute, but when they do those quizzes, it will just, you know, if you don't pick a redo score, it will just go and let them on to the next activity, even if they got every answer wrong. So if you don't want it to do that, if you want them to have to pass a certain, um, 
you know, level in order to move on to the next section, you can select this score, but it is optional. So language arts, we could do the same thing. If I thought that, you know, she didn't really need to learn about suff suffixes or whatever, I could take out whatever I felt wasn't necessary. So that's really great that it's customizable that way. I'm not going to do that today. So we're going to just say uh, all materials for everything. Create my activity plan. And so now we've got a plan for each week. Again, if you had like taken the time to customize it all, you'd have a very beautiful detailed plan. But if you just leave it as if, as is, you've got a plan for every week. So starting next week, here's the plan. You can pick which day because I had picked three days. Again, you can change that. You can change all of it. It's one of the things I think is really cool about this time for learning curriculum website is how customizable it is. So you could print this if you wanted, if you're the type to do that. I'm not that organized. But anyway, so that's how you go in and make your lesson plans. Now, when you go over to manage students, this is where you can change the grade level. So they also have a membership letter that you can print. I imagine this would be if you live in a state where they require more like proof of homeschooling. So that's here for you in the manage students section. And then this is where you can update courses. So right now I've got her in third grade for everything, but you can either switch the whole thing to second grade or fourth grade. Or you could stay at third grade and then say like, oh, but she needs a little more help with the reading. Oh, she's really great at math. You know, just change them as you see fit as the parent. And also included are these additional extensions. So you can add a language art extension and time for math facts. You can change this between addition and subtraction or multiplication and division, but it has to be one or the other. Once you've got it all set up the way that you want it as a parent, the right grade level, the right subjects you want your child to learn, you've done your lesson plans, you've printed out all those principles, if that's your kind of thing, now it's time for your student to actually use this and do their work on it. So. Got to log out of the parent account and switch over to the student section. So here's what the student dashboard looks like. Here we've got language arts, math, the time for math facts, which is that extra little thing that you had to pick division and multiplication or adding and subtracting. We've got science, we've got social studies, and then this time for languages, which is extra and I have not added. Although I think I might, um, I'm not sure what it costs, but anyway. Now, if your child goes here to my plan, this is gonna show them what they're supposed to do each week based on what you have selected. So we're already into this week. So let's go to week of January 15th. So. If my child was here and she clicked on this week, she would know that she's got to do chapter one of vocabulary skills, homophones, idioms, and that would be it for language arts for the week. Then for math, she would be doing number theory and systems, addition and subtraction, sums and differences, and that would be all her math for the week, science, and then social studies. So this is the, the student's place. This is where they're going to be. They're going to click on open activity. It's going to load up their activity. They're going to click start. And something, <laughs> something will begin for them.
Okay, and then there's a continue button down here. It shows up top the um, progress of each lesson. And picture this. Chip's great great granddaughter is going skiing. He warns her to be careful. What is the suffix of the word careful? Care, F U L, forgetful, or if you aren't sure, just let me know. Yay. A suffix is a letter or a group of letters that comes at the end of a base word to create a new related word. So then, you got it right. You hit continue. Hey there, thanks for coming. Okay, I'm going to pause that here. My daughter did do some lessons today, and I do have those to share if you want to see a little bit like what it's like to go through the lessons. Now, hopefully you understand how time for learning works. If you haven't ever taken a look at the pricing before, I have it for you here. So from pre-K to eighth grade, it's going to be $24.95 a month for the first student. And then if you have more than one student enrolled, it's going to be another $15 or $14.95 a month for each additional student. Once you get to high school, it's a little more pricey at $34.95 a month per student. But if you compare this to an online private school, it's much, 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 much more affordable. And if you live in an area like I do where there are not any free, where there are not any free public online schools, then this is really a great affordable option. If you're interested in adding the foreign language option, it is going to be 15, it is going to be 59.95 for six months of unlimited foreign language access. This sounds really good to me. I think it would be really great for my daughter to learn a foreign language. So we might add that, but that's the price. So now here is the part of the video where my daughter did some of the school herself. If you're interested in seeing what it's all about, keep watching. If it's you're Aaron. not interested, Today, just we'll fast forward to the end where the I share my honest opinion and review Have you ever of been the really program. Excited to play a new game with your friends? Maybe you were thinking about who would be on your team instead of listening to the rules. When the game started, you didn't know what to do. You could learn a lesson from what happened. You could learn that it's important to listen. Lots of stories teach lessons too, like how to share or how to be a good friend. Lessons and stories are called morals. Let's take a look at today's learning goal. We'll learn how to find the moral in a fable. Are you ready to get started? Okay, let's go. First, we'll talk about what you already know. You know a story has a problem that the main character solves. Lots of times, readers can learn something from how that problem is solved. Now let's talk about what you need to know. A fable is a kind of story that is written to teach a lesson or moral. You can find the moral in a fable by following three steps. First, look for a problem that is solved. Then ask yourself, what can the characters learn? Last, say the moral in your own words. Remember, the moral is the lesson the characters learn. Now, let's read a short fable about a frog. 
We'll use these steps to find the moral in the fable. Are you ready? The Noisy Frog No one in the swamp liked the frog. He was too noisy. Then one day, he saw a hungry crocodile. He croaked loudly to warn his friends. After that, like the frog. Last, say the moral in your own words. Remember, the moral is the lesson the characters learn. Now, let's read a short fable about a frog. We'll use these steps to find the moral in the fable. Are you ready? The Noisy Frog No one in the swamp liked the frog. He was too noisy. Then one day, he saw a hungry crocodile. He croaked loudly to warn his friends. After that, everyone was glad to have the Noisy Frog around. Now, we need to find the moral or lesson in this fable. Let's look at it again. Notice the beginning of the fable. We know that no one in the swamp liked the frog. He was too noisy. That's a problem. No one likes the noisy frog. And in the middle, we see how the problem is solved. Then one day, he saw a hungry crocodile. He croaked loudly to warn his friends. Being noisy is a problem, but warning your friends of danger is a helpful thing to do. Now let's look for something the characters learned. Do you see it? It's right here. After that, everyone was glad to have the noisy frog around. The animals in the swamp learned just how helpful a noisy frog can be. At first, the characters didn't like the noisy frog, but his loud croaks helped keep them safe. Now, we can put the moral into our own words. Let's say it like this. Sometimes we don't like someone at first, but that person can turn out to be a good friend. That's a great moral to remember. Good job finding the moral. Let's think back to what you learned. Today you learned to find the moral in a fable. First, look for how a problem is solved. Then ask yourself, what do the characters learn? Last, Say the moral in your own words. If you've got all that, you can move on. But if you're not sure, no problem. You can just watch this again. Hey there, I'm Jason. And I'm here to help you practice finding the moral in a fable. As you answer the following questions, here are some things to keep in mind. Remember what you learned about finding the moral in a fable. First, look for how a problem is solved. Then, ask yourself, what do the characters learn? Last, say the moral in your own words. I'm ready whenever you are. You're about to read a fable called The Nest. Remember, a fable is a kind of story that's written to teach a lesson or moral. This fable is about You're about to read a fable called The Nest. Remember, a fable is a kind of story that's written to teach a lesson or moral. This fable is about a bird that learns a very important lesson. As you read, Look for the lesson that she learns. The Nest Bluebird wanted to build a nest, 
There, shining in the grass, were yellow, green, purple, and orange ribbons. Wow, whispered Bluebird. I will build a rainbow nest. Soon the other birds saw her. Can we have some ribbon? They asked. No, shouted Bluebird. I saw them first. They're all mine. Bluebird worked all day. She used the ribbons to make a rainbow nest. It looked amazing on the outside, but inside the nest, Bluebird wasn't happy. She felt lonely. After Bluebird makes her nest, she isn't happy. What problem does she have? Bluebird had an idea. She called to the other birds. Please come share my rainbow nest. All the birds flew up to join her. Think about how Bluebird solves her problem. Bluebird learned something important that day. Now the nest looked amazing on the outside and it felt good on the inside too. Bluebird learned something important. What did she learn? Bluebird solves a problem in this fable. What problem does she solve? The correct answer is A. Her nest feels lonely inside. What's a good way to figure out this answer? You can read paragraph 3 again. Here it is below. You can see what makes Bluebird unhappy. This helps you find the problem she solves. In paragraph 3, we learn that inside the nest, Bluebird wasn't happy. She felt lonely. Feeling lonely is Bluebird's problem. In the next paragraph, you can see how the problem is solved. Bluebird says, Please come share my rainbow nest! And all the birds flew up to join her. So, Bluebird isn't lonely anymore. She solved her problem. Make sense? What does Bluebird learn in this fable? The correct answer is D. Bluebird learns to share with the other birds. What's a good way to figure out this answer? Remember, Bluebird's problem is that she's lonely. You can read paragraph 4 again to see how she solves her problem. This helps you understand what she learns. Here's paragraph 4 below. You can see how Bluebird solves her problem. She tells the other birds, Please come share my rainbow nest. Then, in paragraph 5, we find out what Bluebird learns. After the other birds join her, she's not lonely anymore. Now the nest looked amazing on the outside, and it felt good on the inside, too. Bluebird learned to share. Got it? Which sentence tells the moral of this fable? Drag the sentence that tells the moral into the chart. Let's talk about the answer together. Sharing makes you feel good inside is the moral of this fable. At the end of the story, Bluebird feels good inside because she shared with her friends. Got it? Hurry, hurry, step right up! It's time to test your skills and show off what you know. Get four questions right and win the top prize. Which of the following is true about fables? That's right. The answer is B. A fable is a story that teaches a lesson or moral. Now read the beginning of this fable. A duck lived in a pond. A beaver and a muskrat also lived in the pond. One day, Duck caught a big fish. Will you share the fish with us? Asked Muskrat. We are hungry too. But Duck said, no, this is my fish. What is the problem in this story? Not quite. The 
correct answer is D. The problem is that Duck won't share his fish, even though the other animals are hungry too. Now read the rest of the fable. Two days later, Muskrat caught an even bigger fish. He was so happy. Will you share your fish with us? Beaver asked. I will gladly give some to you, Beaver, but Duck gets nothing because he doesn't share. Duck waddled away sadly as the two friends ate fish. Which sentence best helps the reader understand the moral of the story? Great! The answer is C. Duck didn't share his fish, so Muskrat didn't share with him. The moral or lesson of the story is about sharing. Read the rest of the fable again. Two days later, Muskrat caught an even bigger fish. He was so happy. Will you share your fish with us? Beaver asked. I will gladly give some to you, Beaver, but Duck gets nothing because he doesn't share. Duck waddled away sadly as the two friends ate fish. What is one way to say the moral of this fable? Awesome! The answer is D. If you don't share with others, they might not share with you, is the moral of the fable. Duck didn't share his fish, so Muskrat didn't share with Duck. Bravo! You got three out of four right! You want a new pet. Giggles the goldfish! Listen, quiz. The quiz questions will be asked one at a time. For each one, enter the best answer. When you have answered a question, click Next to continue. Take as long as you need to answer each question. Hey there, Jeannie here. Today you're going to learn about understanding hundreds. Think about it. Have you ever counted a large number of things? Like a big stack of books? Like Abby. Abby needs help counting books at the book sale. She needs to count all the books on her table. And she's got a lot of books on her table. She starts counting by ones. Then Abby realizes it'll go much faster if she counts by tens instead. So, she moves the books into stacks of ten. Then, she counts ten books at a time. Sounds like a great idea. Counting books in groups of ten is much faster. Today's learning goals are to learn that ten tens make one hundred. You'll also model a number using base ten blocks. Are you ready to get started? Let's go! Let's talk about what you know. You know that 10 ones can be grouped together to make one group of 10. See this block? It's called a tens rod. You've also worked with two digit numbers like 19. Remember, each digit has a different value. The one is in the tens place. This tells you that there is one 10. The nine is in the ones place. This tells you that there are nine ones. Now that we've got that covered, let's go over what you need to know. Let's check back in with Abby. Abby needs help counting books at the book sale. She needs to count all the books on her table. Let's show the books with unit cubes, like this. She thought it would be easier to count the books by moving them into stacks of 10. Remember, a group of 10 unit cubes can be shown with a tens rod. Let's do that for the other unit cubes. Now, all the books are shown with tens rods. Then Abby counts 10 books at a time. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. 
there are 100 books on Abby's table. So, how many groups of 10 equal 100? Let's count each group of 10 together. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There are 10 groups of 10 in 100. Now, if you put together 10 tens rods, you get a hundreds flat. Did you notice that there are no tens rods or unit cubes left over? Wow! So 10 groups of 10 make 100, and 100 can be shown with a hundreds flat. How would you model 200? Yep, with two hundreds flats. All right, maybe one of our friends can show us how to model three hundreds. Take it away. <laughs> Great job. Hey, did you notice that for each of these numbers in the hundreds, there are zero tens and zero ones? See that? All right, now that you've got that down, let's take a look at another example. Abby's class made bookmarks to sell at the book sale. Abby used base 10 blocks to model the number of bookmarks. How many bookmarks are there? There are two hundreds, 100, 200. There are three tens, 10, 20, 30. There are zero ones. That makes 230. There are 230 bookmarks. So, in a three digit number, like 230, the first digit tells you how many hundreds, two hundreds. The second digit tells you how many tens, three tens. And the third digit tells you how many ones, zero ones. Now you've got it. Let's take a look at what you learned. Today you learn to understand hundreds. You learn that 10 tens make 100. You also learned how to model a number using base 10 blocks. Have you got it? Great, then let's move on. But if you're not sure, no problem. You could just watch this again. Hi there, I'm Jason, and I'm here to help you practice understanding hundreds. As you answer the following questions, here are some things to keep in mind. Ten tens make one hundred. You can model a number using base ten blocks. Continue whenever you're ready. Bill is playing a game and has 426 points. He's making a place value chart to show his points. Drag blocks to complete. Okay, let's review the correct answers together. In the number 426, there are four hundreds. So, we drag four hundreds flats to the hundreds column. There are two tens. So, we drag two tens rods to the tens column. There are six ones. So, we drag six unit cubes to the ones column. Make sense? Click the three answers that show 100, 5 tens, and 0 ones. Hmm, 
Looks like you didn't get all the answers. Think about how you can model 100. You can show 100 with 10 tens rods, or you can bundle 10 tens together as a hundreds flat. Give the problem another try. Okay, let's talk about the answers together. This number shows a 1 in the hundreds place and a 5 in the tens place. These blocks show 100s flat makes 100. 5 tens rods makes 50. These blocks show 150. 10 tens makes 100. 5 more tens makes 50. Got it? Anne has 231 beads. How could Anne use base 10 blocks to show 231? The correct answer is D. Let's see how to solve this problem. There are two hundreds, three tens, and one one in 231. Use two hundreds flats to show two hundreds. Use three tens rods to show three tens. And use one unit cube to show one. These blocks show 231. Great job. See you next time. Before I get into my honest review and opinion of this whole Time for Learning website, I just want to remind you I do have a link to Time for Learning, how you can sign up in my description below, as well as that link I mentioned before for the printables from Creative Fabrica, the teacher club card, for $2.99 a year. Okay. So just a few things that I have noticed about this, things that I like, things that I don't like so much. So things that I like, being able to customize the grade level and the lesson plan. I like the, I like that they have a lot of material, including the principles. I like that it is self-paced. I like that the parent can remove lessons that they don't think are necessary. I like that it includes science and social studies, although for the elementary age, I wish it did have a little bit more. Although as homeschooling families and as particularly, and particularly those that lean more towards unschooling, we're really most concerned with the math and the reading and the rest we get just kind of through living life, right? So if you're looking at a good math and reading program, I do feel that this is a very good program. I've looked at some of the free online ones. My daughter just wanted nothing to do with it. So this is the best that I feel is actually educational that we could find for a very reasonable price. Now the drawbacks, number one is when my daughter's doing the lesson plans, a lot of times there are glitches and when, when it's open and you're hitting continue to go to the next thing, it won't work and you kind of have to go back, click it again, go forward. A lot of times when you do that and then you get back to the main page, it didn't record that the lesson was completed. My daughter finds that very frustrating because she doesn't want to click through the whole thing again just to get the check mark. That's number one. Number two drawback that I found, at least for my daughter, is that some of the lessons are very repetitive. Um, you know, she's going through the lesson and they will kind of just really drive that point home a little too many times, which then she finds very boring. And that can be a little frustrating because it won't let you skip past stuff even if you already know the answer. For instance, you'll, and you saw in that little clip I showed of her doing it, um, 
Well, I can show it here again. She's trying to click forward because she already got the answer right. She wants to move on. She got the right answer, but it's still going to say why the answer was right, even though she already got it right. She wants to move on. So I wish it would kind of let you click past faster if, you know, you, you got it and you don't need to keep hearing the same thing over and over again. So it's a little redundant. Um, my daughter also has made comments that she finds it to be a little babyish. And, you know, depending on your own child, whether that's a problem or not is, you know, that's going to be an individual child's opinion. But you can cancel at any time. You know, you just pay the $25 a month. It's not like a yearly thing. It's monthly, so you can cancel it at any time. So it's definitely worth $25 just to see if it's something that is a good fit for your family. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please consider leaving a like if you did. If you have any questions about Time for Learning or the Teacher Club card or anything to do with homeschooling, please leave me a comment. I promise to get back to you with an answer. As always, thank you so much for watching.